Okay, brilliant. Right, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the uh, Edgebuston Ward Forum meeting. This is this is the first one that we're holding uh, online. Um, I think it might well be the last one we hold online because, as I understand it, the regulations are about to change in May, and we we'd be going back to holding in-person meetings. Although I'm not a hundred percent certain how forums, but but it's certainly the first one. I can be sure of that. Um, so um, the purpose of tonight is uh, you're familiar, I, most of you, I imagine, with the ward forums and, and how they work. Um, just to tell you that this is being recorded um, for future record uh, and it will be available, I believe, on the council's YouTube channel uh, for anyone to watch um, when, when we're done. So um, that's that's something to, uh, to pass on and show everybody. Um, now, a uh, couple of things I just wanted to say about etiquette. I, I imagine many of you are familiar with using Teams meetings, which have become a, a, such a part of our lives over the past year. But I just wanted to um, say a couple of things about etiquette, about how, how these things are done, if you're not sure. And perhaps better if you could just put the, the page on the, on the um, screen that shows uh, the top tips for using Microsoft Teams. Um, if you uh, wish to raise, uh, if you wish to have a, ask a question, then you need to raise your hand, which um, is usually at the top of the screen. There's a little icon with a smiley hand and a face, and you click on and, and you raise your hand. Um, then uh, if you, and then th that will indicate to me that you wish to speak and I will come to you and it will be in the order that it appears on my screen, the people who wish to speak. You can also, if you wish, wish to ask a question, just ask it in the chat. Again, I think it's near the top of your screen. There's a little circle with some lines on and that indicates chat. So you can either indicate that you wish to ask a question or you can actually ask the question in the chat and we'll, we'll try and work it in. You can do it whichever way suits you. Um, and that's really how the meeting works. The other etiquette, which I'm pleased to see everyone's observing, is that if you're not actually speaking, then you keep your camera and your microphone off. Um, the exception uh, being my, myself and Deirdre, who oh, Deirdre's, Deirdre's turned her camera off very, very diligent, but um, I thought it'd be useful if you could at least see, see us at the moment. Uh, but we will obviously switch off when uh, when we have other speakers. So I didn't introduce ourselves as well. I'm Councillor Matt Bennett. I'm chairing this meeting and my ward colleague is Councillor Deirdre Alden. Um, keeping us in line, we have Beverly Edmead, who uh, doesn't have her camera working, or does, sorry, doesn't have a camera on her monitor, So she, but I think many of you will know her anyway, so you don't need to, um, we, we, you don't need to be reminded of, 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 her, of her appearance because you will remember it already. Um, before we go any further, I did just want to mention it's been a year or over a year since we were into this, uh, this COVID situation and we haven't met at all in that time. And I didn't want to proceed further in the meeting without uh, remarking on the passing of Ken Brown, who uh, provided great support to us in, in this ward, uh, attended many of the ward forum meetings. Most of you will know him and he was very supportive uh, in terms of the local innovation fund and the project we had here. He passed away, I think, nearly a year ago now. So um, it, it's somewhat belated um, condolences and marking his passing, but I did think we should put on record uh, the contribution that he'd made to this ward. So moving on from, from that, um, we have the first item on the agenda is um, uh, COVID-19 and the latest information and update. Do we have Mary here? We do. Good evening, Councillor. Hello, Mary. Thank you for coming. That's fine. Uh, and good evening to everyone. So um, I'll just give a, a, sort of a quick um, overview of where we are um, in Birmingham as a city and, and then some specifics about um, about the ward. Um, so yes, it's about a year on. We've been um, in this pandemic and, and much has happened. Um, in the last few months in particular, we have been in lockdown from which we are just emerging. Um, we've had absolutely soaring rates in the past um, and yes, they are coming down, but we are still in the pandemic. Um, things are looking much more positive. We've got many more tools with which to, to deal with this. We've got a better sense of understanding of what we need to do for the moment. Um, so our case rate for the city is 42 per 100,000. Now, we do this per 100,000, so it makes it easy for us to compare um, within the city, um, but also with other places. So 
42 per 100,000 would mean that in a city of about 1.2 million or just under, it's going to be 12 times 42 cases in the last seven days. Um, but as a comparison, in the previous seven day period, um, which would have been the 20th to the 26th of March, we were at 72. So it is falling and it is falling rapidly. Um, however, um, and you would expect me to say this, um, COVID has shown us that when it, when it goes up, it goes up exponentially. And so even though things seem to be falling, um, we have to remain vigilant about our, our situation and all our precautionary measures. Um, moving on from the, um, the, the city position, just to give you um, a bit of flavour to that is spread seems to be primarily um, through household and social and workplace interactions. Um, we are starting to see some evidence of spread in schools. That's not surprising. Um, schools have been back a few weeks now. Um, but pr primarily spread is through household, um, social and workplace interactions. Um, hospital admissions are well down on what they were previously. We're getting about six to 17 new cases a day. Um, at, for example, at the University Hospitals Birmingham Trust. If we're looking at the West Midlands, for example, we're not at the top. We're, we're not. We're not the worst. Um, we're, we're not the best. Um, we're somewhere in the middle, at our 42 per hundred thousand. In some other areas, it's it's in the 60s, and in some other areas, it's below 20. Um, and if we're comparing Birmingham with our core cities, which is another comparison we frequently do. So these core cities are places such as Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Newcastle. Um, you know, again, we're, we're not at the top. There are some in their 80s and again, there are others in their 20s. So Birmingham somewhere somewhere in the middle there. Um, for the ward specific, Edgbaston is currently ranked 30th out of 69, where one would be the highest. So in the last seven days, we've had six reported cases um, in Edgbaston, but we've got to adjust that for population because the population of our wards varies. So to help compare, um, do some comparison there, the rate for the ward would be 27,000 um, comparing with a, a city rate of um, 38, sorry, 37 using those particular statistics. So definitely about, I'd say about two thirds, three quarters of the city rate. So not a bad place to be. Obviously, we're still wanting that to uh, to shrink and to fall further. Um, and, and while we're also on the topic of what, we, what we've got within the ward, we've got 18 COVID champions. Um, for those who don't, don't know what COVID champions are. They are members of the live or work in the city. Um, and it's an opportunity for people to get reliable information from um, reliable, trusted sources, um, which they can then share with their networks as they choose friends, family, um, work colleagues, etc. Um, and be a champion for the positive COVID messages. But we also have specific webinars and events where we get to hear to hear back from COVID champions about um, what's working well or not working or concerns relating to COVID um, or explanations that are needed. So if you've um, not considered it, do a COVID champion. Um, last but not least, I think for where we're at, we, we know the testing facilities we've got across the city. Um, for people who are symptomatic, we've still got our drive-through facilities, two of them, and our walk-through facilities are further 10. For people who do not have symptoms, which we refer to as asymptomatic, um, there's a whole range of places that you can get tested. For example, if you need to go to work or in some instances, if you need to go to school. Um, and that's something that we're all going to become a lot more familiar with, the, the, the process of getting um, because we do know that some people can't um, that that is an offer we've got through our community pharmacies we've got a hundred of them across the city um, 
as well as other testing sites, um, some hub, a hub and some spokes um, that we've got access to. Moving on from testing, just to touch on vaccination driven by the NHS and the role of the local authority has been very much a support role in terms of engaging and encouraging people to take part in um, vaccination when offered, to take it up when offered. So vaccination across the city, um, we've had different age groups. Um, we had priority groups, I should say. It started with age groups. So we started with people over 80, then 75 and 70. Then we had the clinically extremely vulnerable individuals, probably commonly referred to as people who were shielding. Um, and then the 65 and over, and then COVID at risk, and then 60 and over, and 55, and now 50 and over. And uh, in Birmingham, sort of 89%, and for Edgbaston, that would be 87%, so pretty close. Um, and the lowest um, uptake would be 68%. Um, for those who are 50 and over, it's just got to their turn. So I still expect that figure to rise. Um, and for those at COVID risk, similarly. But otherwise, rates are uptake is in the 70s and 80s, um, which is which is fairly good. Um, understandably, there was some hesitancy around taking up the vaccine, but there's been a huge amount of work by colleagues in the NHS, local authority, and lots of other individuals to explain what the vaccine is about, how it's been produced, what confidence we have in it, um, answering questions. And we've had information back to, to demonstrate that the proportion of people who were hesitant about taking the vaccine has fallen um, between sort of December when we started to roll it out and now. Um, one poll indicated that it had dropped from 24% who weren't sure whether they'd take it now down to 6%. So um, a big thank you to all of you who have in your various ways, you know, contributed to promoting the uptake of vaccination. So vaccination is in our armory, um, but we have to continue with our prevention measures. So whilst the city is reopening and we are regaining some of our um, cherished freedoms, we, we do need to continue to um, maintain appropriate distance from others who are not in our household bubble. Um, we also need to wash our hands, not touch our face, wear a face, co um, a face covering or mask um, where it's required to do so and you're able to do so. Um, and obviously, if you're offered the vaccine, you know, do, do take it. Um, I've had mine. Well, I've had my first dose. So, um, so yes, I would strongly recommend that. But the prevention measures are still important. Pause and take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Mary. Um, that, that was very useful. I haven't seen any hands up, so I'm, I'm just going to um, say a couple of things myself, really. First, uh, firstly, um, I do want to pay tribute to the work that's been done, not just by the NHS, who you've already mentioned, but by the public health team here in Birmingham, who've been doing a great job of spreading the message around during what's been a very, very difficult year for everyone. Um, and I want to endorse what you said about the uh, the vaccine, really. I mean, it's, it's really important that everybody gets vaccinated. Uh, who get, you know, everyone who's offered a vaccine gets the vaccine and there's a lot of good work being done to, to persuade people. I understand from um, a meeting I was at a few weeks ago that people who have turned down the vaccine get phone calls from the from the GP surgery. They get a conversation with the GP if, if necessary as well. And they do. They tell me that that does tend to make about a 10 percent difference. So, you know, if, if an area has gone a 60 percent um take up that will get it up to 70 percent though, though it will it, it does turn big around but it, it's slow going doing that so i think everyone who, who has the vaccine if you, can, if you know anyone who's who's hesitant in any way make sure you, you tell them how how worthwhile it is um but the, the i mean the the thing that gets asked a lot i do know is this um what seems to be i think quite rightly a level of caution we are we've got a falling case rates we are i think we've got the lowest rate in Europe now as of today. Um, so the vaccine does appear to be doing its job and working, but we are still being very, very cautious in terms of opening up. 
Um, Mary, some of the certainly at my end, some of the, some of your talk was was got a bit scrambled. So give me some of the things you say. It's it said it's possible you did cover it, but can you just explain a bit more about why we're being so cautious here and why we're not rushing to open up in the way that some people <laughs> say that we should? Right. I think, you know, we, we've been on a bit of a roller coaster the past 12 months. And I mean, to be fair to um, the various policymakers that we need to um, take cognizance of is we've we've all been on a, a steep learning curve. So we know something about coronaviruses. We know something about how pandemics work. Um, but we needed to know what was happening. Specifically, well, we didn't have testing facilities on the scale and with the access that we have now. Um, and what we learned was that actually when we reopened um, and transmission started to go up again, we weren't able to detect it and nip it in the bud soon enough. So our testing facilities, our, our access to testing, whether you're symptomatic or, symptom, or asymptomatic, is much better than it was a year ago. And I think there's a lot of messaging out there about how people can access that testing. Um, we also are aware that there's a, a period of time, we refer to it as an incubation period. So if a, if a virus is transmitted, it takes a while, incubates, uh, and then a person may end up with an infection that they're able to then transmit to others. That takes a few weeks. And so whilst rates are falling, if, there, if we were to pivot suddenly, um, we wouldn't necessarily know about it for a few more weeks. So the, the rates we're seeing today is a measure, almost an indication of the situation we had a few weeks previously. And we, um, having had two and a half, three lockdowns, um, I think it's understandable that we want to take a step, have some confidence that that step has worked to the extent that we thought it might work, and then take the next step. Um, I can understand why people are in a hurry to to open up more quickly, um, but when you're dealing with something that increases exponentially, it's not a straight line. It's not a case of one becomes two, becomes three and four. It's a more a case of one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and before you know it, two fifty six and much higher. Um, and we were there three months ago. You know, in January, we were we were looking at 700 and something cases per 100,000. That's 700 and something cases times 12 for the city of Birmingham in a seven day period. That's more than we have now in the, across the whole city. So so we don't want to go back there. I think um, slowly, slowly is is one way forward. The other thing to recognize is that whilst we compare ourselves with other European cities, um, the United Kingdom has lots of connections. As example, we have lots of connections with parts of the world, and there are people in the United Kingdom who have reason to travel to all over the world, and people from all over the world who come to the United Kingdom. And so we need to be vigilant about what is not just happening in the United Kingdom, but also what is happening elsewhere. And we need to have in place the systems to to respond to that um, and to take appropriate action. And I think we're much better placed now to do that. Um, so you know, if someone comes into the country, you've got to date certain tests before you come in. Um, you then have to retest again at day two and again at day eight. Um, there are what we call the variants of concern. Some are just more infectious, so that means more people get them. But some are more serious and are associated with more death. And so there's a vigilance around that. We are part of a global world. And so whilst our situation in Birmingham and indeed the United Kingdom looks good at the moment, I think it would be fair to say we're not in sync with what's happening um, in other parts of, let's say, Europe, for example. So as happened in the first wave, some of the countries had it worse a few weeks ahead of us um, and some afterwards. And what's happening now, we've had a really torrid you know, December, January, February, 
Um, some other countries weren't in that position then, but they are now going through some particularly challenging times. Um, so we're not all in sync. And that's another reason why we have to be um, cautious about the way forward. The other thing about being cautious about the way forward is we, it was always a map, it's a plan. But if we have to make change or if change has to be made, then I think we need to be grown up about it and say, here's why it has to be made and this is what has to happen. So much as we really want it to go all to plan, this virus has been throwing us a few curveballs and um, it's not going to give up lightly. That's what these viruses do. Um, so I think cautious is probably the way I would suggest we go forward. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, welcome, Hugh. Would you mind just turning your camera off, please? Um, the, 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 the way these meetings work is we keep camera, cameras off unless somebody's talking. So um, if you mind doing that, thank you. Um, Jeremy Lang has asked a question, which I'll just read out. Um, uh, do I need to worry about all the media scare over clotting in the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine? So my response to that would be, no, you don't need to worry about it. So we've got uh, a joint committee on vaccines and immunisation, um, JCVI. They look at vaccines, you know, year in, year out. Um, they've been doing this for everything from measles, mumps, rubella, flu, the lot. Um, and what's happening with the um, data and feedback um, on reactions to the vaccine is that that is being looked at a lot more quickly than it would typically, because we're in a you know, very dynamic situation. They've looked at it and their view is at the moment, they do not see any reason to be concerned. Now, every country can make its decision. We've got a committee that I've, I'm confident about. Um, they certainly know more about it than I do. Um, and they are also quite open about what they have considered so the fact that we've got data about what adverse reactions people have reported. If I have a vaccine, I have a headache. I phone in and say I have a headache. That's one more person with a headache. Um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any reason for us to be concerned about it. If and when that changes, they will let us know. And I think we, we again, you know, being being grown up about this is recognizing that in a dynamic situation where we are still gathering information. Yes, we're using the vaccine, um, but we're still gathering information about it. It's because we're willing to learn. And that may mean that we have to um, make an announcement in some time in the future about our findings and, and then take the appropriate action at that stage. But for the moment, I wouldn't worry about it. I also wouldn't worry about which vaccine I was given. So I, I just rolled up my sleeve. I've got it on my card, which one I was given, but. You know, it was a case of being offered the trusted source. I just roll up my sleeve and get it. Thank you. There was actually a very useful um, chart that was put out after today's announcement, um, which I, I think if you can find this online is, is worth looking at. Today they announced that um, the AstraZeneca vaccine will not be recommended, although it could still be used for anyone uh, in the age bracket, basically under, under, I think it's 20 to 29. And the reason for that is, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny risk of, of blood clotting. And there's also a tiny, tiny risk of blood clotting from catching COVID. And that age group is the only one where the tiny, tiny, tiny risk of blood clotting from the vaccine would appear to outweigh the tiny, tiny risk of blood clotting from COVID. So it's only in that age group where it would, it might make sense not to have that vaccine. Um, and that's that's what was put out today following today's announcements about the, 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 the but even then they're saying that they would they would try to give Moderna or Pfizer as opposed to AstraZeneca um, to the under 30s. But they're still not saying it's they're still saying it's 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 safe. It's just that that tiny, tiny, tiny risk in that age group is the that's the only age group where it outweighs the tiny risk of blood clotting in, in from catching COVID. I hope that makes sense. But if you if you look for the chart online, I can assure you it makes it very, very clear in just a blink of an eye. Does anyone else yeah. have any questions? Uh, Sorry. So can I just add to that that when we started, you know, what we've experienced in this country is a horrendous, absolutely horrendous loss of life due to COVID. Um, 
and a huge numbers of people being hospitalised. And yes, that's pressure on the NHS, but that's also a lot of people who've had the experience of going to hospital with a really horrid, horrid illness, um, many of whom have needed, you know, oxygen and intubation and critical care support. And when we started giving the vaccine, the, the purpose, the, when we were weighing up what would this give us, what was the main benefit, it was to reduce the likelihood, to reduce the risk of deaths and reduce the severity of the experience. It's not preventing it entirely, but reducing the severity of experience so that we don't have so many people requiring critical care and, and extensive hospital support. Um, and you can see from the ages of the people who've predominantly been in hospital and predominantly who have died, that it's not in that age group that we're looking at. So when we're weighing up the tiny risk of clot and tiny risk of um, vaccine, etc., in a much younger age group, COVID can affect people at all ages. But the vast majority of people who were turning up in hospital were much older. And in the most recent wave, that age had come down. We we're getting people, you know, initially it was 70s and 80s, and then it was coming down to 60s and 50s. So all of that is considered um, when it's, you know, do we give a vaccine? Do we give a vaccine to people at all? Um, which vaccine do we give them? But for the vast majority of people, certainly over 50, the advantage of having a vaccine, any of the vaccine, um, as far outweighs those those other risks and considerations at the moment. Um, I, ha I don't see any other questions, Mary. I just can't, I just ask you to reiterate one thing. There are a lot of places you can go to get tested to get the lateral flow to the city hospitals. I find myself go uh, once or twice a week if I can. Um, so uh, can you just just um, just to, for anyone who might not be clear about how they go about doing that or where to go, can you just point them in the right direction for that? Yes, so uh, a lateral flow test. So we, we, we've got testing, I'm just going to see where they are again. Um, we've got testing facilities across the across the city for asymptomatic testing. What we um, suggest, it, it, it only takes about 30 minutes or so. It's done on site and it's good for identifying people who don't have symptoms, um, but may be infectious. And what we're suggesting is that First and foremost, if you're part of a, if you have to leave home for work, or if you're part of a care or support bubble, you should be testing regularly every um, three to four days. We now have a fixed testing site at the Hippodrome in the city centre, um, but we've also got fixed testing sites at Sheldon, King Standing, Handsworth Wellbeing Centre, Chardin, Oddingley Hall, Maypole Youth Centre, and Mayor Green Community Centres. In addition to that, we've got mobile community testing spokes, which can be booked. Um, and we will also have, um, we've gone up from 100, we've now got 105 pharmacies. So there is a, a website um, that will give you details on how to book. And I'm going to pop that in the chat. If that could be disseminated, that would be really helpful. Um, and this is for people who are asymptomatic. So lots and lots of options and lots of ways to get testing in addition for certain staff groups and indeed for certain um, students there are other methods of getting tested depending on the type of work you do but for the you know, general public you need to get tested um, I'll just pop this in the chat now and I'm hoping that it can be disseminated it tells you what is available and where Done that. Thank you very much. It's on the Birmingham on the council website, but I've just posted the link. Thank you very much, Mary. That's very useful. I've been told in the chat that my volume is low. Um, I can't do anything about the volume on the laptop, so I'll just have to chat. Um, but um, thank you very much, Mary. I don't see any other questions, so thank you for your time. That's been very informative. And um, on behalf of all of us, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank um, you. Moving on to the next item, then uh, we have the, um, the Commonwealth Games Commission's to Celebrating Communities Fund, and I think we have Karen Cheney to talk to us about that. Are you here, Karen? Yes, hello, Karen. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I am. <clears throat> yes, thank you. 
Um, so I'm Karen Cheney. I'm head of service for the Neighbourhood Development and Support Unit. Um, we are supporting the Commonwealth Games Legacy Team with the Celebrating Communities uh, grants. So I'll give you a bit of information on background and then a bit around how to apply. Um, so uh, the, following on from the briefing packs that were sent to all the ward councillors in February, the fund actually went live on March the 1st. Um, celebrating Communities is part of the uh, legacy funding. Um, for Edge Baston, the, uh, every ward has uh, across the city has an amount of money for celebrating communities. For Edge Baston, that amount is 22,200. Um, as I've said, NDSU are supporting the Commonwealth Games legacy team with a coordination of this particular fund. In addition to that, there will be two additional supports. Um, uh, Legacy and Birmingham Community Matters have been commissioned by um, uh, the Legacy team to help community groups with proposals and bid writing in a number of priority wards across the city. That commission has just been awarded and they're due to start next week. In addition, there will be additional um, constituency uh, support uh, facilitators to support uh, ward forum meetings with information and participatory decision making on when the proposals come in for for the amount that's allocated to the ward there are three themes general themes for the celebrating communities fund that uh, groups need to uh, meet around getting active uh, ready steady fun and celebrating culture. Now, the core criteria um, for this fund are um, each ward will needs to submit a that submits proposals will need an approved ward plan and priorities, which Ed Edgebaston does have, and proposals need to align with the general ward prior prior. Sorry, I've got my teeth in ward priorities and projects must add value as opposed to replace any lost services. Um, there are opportunities to apply. Um, the first one is from this March to the 1st of June with uh, ward decision making after that in preparation for monies to be spent from October 21 and onwards. And then uh, the second opportunity, if um, if there are still monies av available, will be uh, from October to January, uh, January 2022, with the ward decision making in uh, April for events to be uh, for events to be uh, run from April through to August uh, 2022. Um, the amounts can can range from. From £100, if groups want to put something um, on very locally, up to uh, £10,000. There are three different application forms, one for under £1,000, one for under £5,000, and one for uh, under uh, up to the limit of £10,000. Um, in terms of um, availability of the money, it's for all constituted community groups and schools are also able to apply for the funding. All the information and the proposal forms are on the Commonwealth Games um, website and I'll put the details in once I've, uh, I've finished in the chat. Um, it, uh, there's also a, a nice uh, short video uh, which relates to the fund um, as well. And then lastly, just there are two additional areas within the legacy funding uh, alongside the celebrating communities, but these aren't ward specific funds. These are uh, citywide and that, that is um, an amount that's been set aside for culture and arts activities. And the last one that's just gone through cabinet is for physical activity and stronger communities. Um, so that's br in brief, uh, Councillor, the, um, 
the broad update. I don't know if there are any specific questions or uh, if, if, if there are ones that I can't answer, then I'll certainly take them back to the legacy team uh, to answer. Um, I, I haven't got any questions from from anyone else at the moment. Um, oh, actually, no, there are. So I'll I'll take that first, and then I'll then I'll ask my questions. Um, oh, okay. This is about the games itself. So I don't I don't know, Karen, whether you're likely to be able to answer this, but I'll, I'll just ask anyway. How much additional traffic is likely when the games start, and how is BCC going to deal with that? I, I, I don't imagine you can answer that. No, I can't answer that. I'm just here purely on the on the celebrating communities. As I mentioned, I'm yeah. not from the Commonwealth Games team. But if there are questions, I'll certainly take them away and I can send them to the appropriate officers within the Commonwealth Games team. Yeah, that, 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 that would be I've useful. I've seen the one about the flag. I think there was one about the flag there earlier on. Flag as well. Yes, yes. Karen, or, or indeed, I mean, anything that comes up that Deirdre and I would know the answer to, we'll try and answer. But between, there's no one here who actually has the Commonwealth Games brief as such. Um, what I was going to ask you, Karen, is, is we've got 22,200 um, in. Edgebaston ward here and we've got two two rounds of bidding uh, i assume if we if 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 we if we wanted to if we want to take a bit more time we, we don't we don't have to spend a certain amount in the first round do we we could have it all in the second round um, absolutely it may well be that uh, some wards might want to run a few pre preliminary events in the first year but then have a bigger a pot of funding for the second year. It really doesn't matter. It is one amount. It's twenty two thousand two hundred, and it is up to you when when you want to um, uh, prioritise for that for that okay. funding. Okay. Um, and um, in, uh, in in so you mentioned schools are eligible. Ha has the information been circulated directly to schools as well? My, my understanding is that the Commonwealth Games legacy team have done have done that. Yes. Okay. okay. So that's, that's that's conversations we can have locally. Um, and, and then I just wondered if you've got any uh, specific examples yet of, of bids that have gone in and been approved, and just some some things we can think of that yeah. that are ideas that are happening. Yeah. Nothing has been approved as yet because uh, with this, it's all about it comes back to the ward forums themselves. So individual groups can put proposals in uh, independently, but they will always come back to the ward forum so that there's uh, particip participatory decision making, um, either by a show of hands or going to uh, um, uh, computers. You can, they're, they're talking about things like that, but I, I think it'll be a show of hands is the easiest way. And you as a ward approve those proposals that you wish to see happening in your ward. So uh, it, it opened on the 1st of, of March. There have been some inquiries. People have asked questions. Um, I don't think I've seen anything that's specific to your, your own ward um, as yet. Um, but some wards are also having then discussions within the ward themselves as to what they'd like to see. And then which local group it might be is the most appropriate to then write the proposal. So there's no right or wrong way. Uh, it's whatever works best in your own ward. And also you can join up with other wards if you want to, if there's something that perhaps goes over what are quite artificial boundaries ac across um, uh, the city. Um, so don't think there's anything in yet. There the, have the been a few that have come in, but I don't think there's anything that's specific for um, Edgebaston. Uh, uh, the, the other question I wanted to ask, and I know there's a, a question from Ms. Dancy, but I, I, uh, before, before that, um, uh, it, it's, uh, there's nothing specifically excluded. Um, uh, well, no, sorry, what, what I wanted to ask was about match funding. I don't think there's a requirement for match funding, is there? But it, presumably if we could secure match funding from elsewhere, that would be so much the better. Um, it's a requirement, but it is suggested, I think, in the brief impacts that you, you had earlier on for the Commonwealth Games legacy team, um, that um, uh, encouraged to perhaps look for match funding. And at the moment, as you know, the NDSU uh, circulate on a regular basis. 
some of the external funding that is available. Um, um, so uh, you don't you don't need it. It's not an essential part, but um, it, it's been suggested that you could um, generate more funding if if you needed from other other sources. Okay. Question from Liz Dance: uh, Fragmentation of initiatives is a problem. Um, if uh, an NHS CCG group leads to uh, a good idea for physical activity for which there is no funding, is an application to this fund appropriate? E.g., over 50s guided cardiac exercise. Is that the kind of thing that could be funded through this? Well, in the first instance, I think it's Liz who's asked it, isn't it, Liz? Yeah. I would actually, that's a really good idea, a really good project, but I would go straight away to the neighbourhood network scheme that covers the constituency, which is absolutely for activities for over 50s. And uh, Liz, I'll put in the chat box for you um, the contact details for the Edge Baston uh, uh, neighbourhood network scheme because um, there's funding funding there that um, uh, is more immediate and, and fits that di directly. Um, it is a celebrating communities fund that I'm talking about. In terms of the, the physical activity, uh, those details haven't yet come out, but I think they're coming through Sport England and, and, and Sport Birmingham and the Active Wellbeing Society. I'm not sure they're they're there yet in terms of getting the details out um, on the website, but they'll they'll be on there very soon. But um, as I say, I think for that particular one, NNS is probably um, the, the best one. Um, and as I say, when I've stopped uh, talking, I'll, I'll 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 put the details in the in the chat box for for Liz. Thank you. Uh, NNS um, at a future World Forum meeting as well, just to get more information for the president. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll arrange that, definitely, if you can make a note of that um, to have it in, uh, for the next meeting. Um, do we have any other questions? I mean, what I'd say is if people have specific ideas they want to discuss, um, then um, please contact Deirdre and I, and we'd be happy to, to talk through some ideas with you. Um, because as Karen says, it's 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 the board will will approve them. Um, so yeah, we want to hear about any ideas, any assistance we can be in getting them worked up. Any other questions for Karen? Okay, well, thank you very much for that. That's very. Uh, that's okay, and I'll I'll stay on and and put the other things in the chat box for you, Councillor. Superb. Thank you very much. OK, um, so we move on then to the uh, the next substantive item on the agenda. In fact, the, the last item on the agenda, local news and information updates. Um, and the first one is from um, ward councillors. And I'm going to ask uh, Deirdre to, to do that. Hi, thank you very much indeed. Um, I've got several things to share with people. Uh, the first thing uh, is something that we've all waited for for absolutely ages, and that is the new crossing facilities on the Pershaw Road, Priory Road, Edgbaston Road Junction, um, which is also going to um, have some cycleway in it as well. And um, people that are long-standing um, attendees at these meetings will know this thing has been talked about for absolutely ages. But I can tell you, we are finally got there. The business case, I'm told, is going to be signed off in April and the contractors will be chosen and appointed in May with the work starting then and the work should be completed by next November. So hopefully, having waited for many years for that, this Priory Road crossing is going to be there before the end of this year. So that's one good thing. Um, it's right by the cricket ground, as everyone will know. Uh, and while on the subject of the cricket ground, anybody who's been down there will see that the work on those uh, large development of flats, of which we had a, a presentation about it at one of these meetings when we were at the Martineau Gardens uh, a couple of years ago now, the work has started on that. Um, and you can see the big equipment, which is digging down because they're having some car parking underneath the buildings so they seem to be doing that at the moment so that has started um, those uh, will not be they, they, the outside of the building should be completed before the commonwealth games um, but the inside will not be and they won't be uh, ready for occupation until um, about uh, late 2023 i think so some way off that but they have started on it um, as for the cricket ground itself obviously they've been very keen to try and stage some events some um, 
with, with some crowds back in um, and they, they are not one of the or some of the ones that have been chosen to be these pilot events such as I think Wembley is going to be for the FA Cup final um, but they do have a, a test match um, in the calendar and it is unfortunately after those pilots and just before uh, June the 21st I think is the date when things are possibly might all open up again, but they are hoping that their test match could be um, a special sort of um, uh, thing called a validation event, I think is the name, There's some, some special title, which would be between a pilot and the real thing. So it would enable them to have um, some, some members of the public in rather more perhaps um, to, as a pilot to see how it works. Obviously, different family groups would be kept separate and everything like that, and people would arrive at different times and everything. Obviously, the details of that aren't, aren't yet uh, sorted out, but they're hoping that they may be able to be some kind of event like that. Um, uh, going back to roadworks things, um, the Greenfield Crescent, anybody who's been along Harbourn Road um, will see that there's been cones out since Christmas almost, yeah, January certainly, um, because of the pedestrianisation work which is um, taking place on Greenfield Crescent, which is a, a joint project between California States and the City Council. Um, that work did run into some problems. It was supposed to be finished by now, but it's not. Uh, I understand that, that hopefully by May, the end of May, certainly, that should be finished at last. The number of cones has reduced now. Um, it starts after the physician now. Um, but as I say, that it did hit some problems, that work, but it should be finished by then. So that will be a, a bonus as well. It will be a nice pedestrianised area uh, and should look rather good. Most, most of the time, partly used for traffic, but mostly pedestrianised. Um, the state of the roads, I'm sure a number of people will have noticed the potholes um, which have opened up, um, partly because of the weather, of course, which does open them up. And, and uh, I have to say, I think um, a lack of maintenance over some while. Uh, and there are a lot of potholes everywhere. Um, I'm going to pass over to Marie um, and, and Stuart possibly in a minute because they may know more about this. But we were asked by Marie to come up with some roads which we thought were the worst roads and pavements. And we did send in a few um, suggestions to make. One of them was, for example, Woodbourne Road, which is only a short stretch of road in our ward. Part of it's in Harbourn Ward, but that short stretch in, in Edgbaston Ward between Gilhurst Road and Augustus Road has been absolutely horrendous for years. Augustus Road is bad as well, I have to say. And we sent that in, and I'd be interested to know um, if anything is happening. Another thing that I sent in was the pavement in um, Church Road outside the Audley development and Sunrise development, where there are obviously a number of elderly people who found that the pavement was um, uneven and, and dangerous. And I did see some work going on there, whether that was because I'd put it forward or whether it was coincidence, I don't know. And I know Matt also put forward separately some other roads. So could I ask Marie at this point if she can give us an update as to when she knows um, if, if and when this work that we suggested will be done? Thank you. Good evening, councillors, uh, members of the public. Uh, well, I don't know, to be honest, I'm glad Stuart is here. I have forwarded all the, the lists of the roads I received from you both, uh, footway and carriageway, um, but I don't know how the roads are going to prior, be prioritised. Or So I'll have to ask Stuart if Stuart can come in and give us a bit of an update. Stuart, please. Hi there, good evening everyone. Thanks for the invite tonight. Yep, so um, Stuart Cross, uh, Highway Steward for Tier Highways. So, yep, um, regarding the future programme, it's not something I have had the, um, again, similar to Marie and the councillors, I've also put my suggestions forward, which I feel uh, those should be prioritised, be it footway, carriage race. I haven't got any say on that unfortunately I haven't got those those details through yet but uh, you would hope they'll be made available later this summer. Um, I do have some information regarding some smaller schemes that have are going on at the moment. If I can share some of those if that'd be useful. Yes please. That'd okay. Be great. Sure so I mean I have got a slide which I'll give you a bit of presentation if you like but I appreciate uh, we're coming to the end now so I don't <laughs> I don't want to bore anyone too much but we have obviously done some work so far uh, um, from April to last year. So uh, we said Harbourn Road, uh, the carriageway down there, perceptions of Hadley Road, and there's some work planned for Lee Bank Middleway and Isleton Road later this spring into summer. 
Um, for me, at the moment, there's probably three main concerns I've got within Edge Baston, um, and I'm sure I must share this with, with everyone here tonight. It's sections of Arthur Road, uh, Bristol Road, and St James's. Um, if I can kind of thank you for your patience regarding those roads at the moment. Um, all three of them are in schemes for significant work this summer. For example, Bristol Road is about 2,000 square metres going in from Edge Baston Park Road into the city. Um, Arthur Road is that section which I'm sure we're all aware of. I think it was resurfaced under Amy, but obviously there was underlying issues there where, where it hasn't gone particularly well. So there's about 1,000 metres going on Arthur Road and St James is about 600. So that's going to take place this summer. So it won't be the whole road, but as opposed to doing smaller patches, it will be significant investment. At the moment, those roads are being uh, with, with a clear design team. So they're taking core samples. So, you know, they're obviously, especially with Arthur Road, there is an underlying issue. So as opposed to wasting any further funds, let's see what the issues are, the issues are on that road. And obviously we can continue to put a decent job on that one. Um, I can give you a very quick presentation if you like, Councillor, if you've got time or... It's on roads that are scheduled to be done, because I think yeah, that would be useful. OK, yeah, well, this is, let me show you quickly. It's just a bit of a, something we've been um, given to share at ward meetings. It won't take a moment for you to share, if you bear with me. Um, OK, let's get the right one. OK, so hopefully you can see that slide now. Um, it's just a very quick update. So as, as I mentioned, Keir took over with the interim service provider. We took over the contract in April last year. So this is just some dates, some information side from April up until uh, December uh, just gone. So it tells you about of carriageway repairs, so 81,000 square metres of carriageway repairs. Um, we have obviously an inspection team, so we've carried about 57,000 square metres of inspections. Um, 23,000 square metres of footway repairs, and obviously there's the other stuff we do as well. So the weed sprained, the winter maintenance, which we were actually out again last night, which doesn't help the roads either, but never mind, what can we do? Um, yep, so this interim contract, uh, that's going to be continuing. Uh, it was meant to be up until June, but there's obviously a good chance that will be extended as well uh, into the near future. So that's just a bit of work that's going on, and um, the good thing is just I'll try to end my little spiel now, but the most important thing for me, obviously working with your councillors and uh, Marie as well. So it's getting that good working relationship together. And yeah, so um, certainly been, been a tough 12 months like everyone, but yeah, we certainly made good strides into uh, repairing a lot of the footways and carriageways where it needs it. So I'll, I'll stop sharing now. If anyone's got any questions or any issues they want to raise, yeah, please thanks. shout out. Thank you, Stuart. Um, yeah, we've, we've kind of moved on to the, the highways one straight from the ward councils, but we have got a number of questions in the chat, which I will just go through and read out. Liz has asked a couple of questions, which I don't think anyone here will be able to answer, but we can certainly get the answer about the cost of extra leaf clearance for the Calthorpe Estate. I mean, that would, that would probably be the Calthorpe Estate to answer, but also the cost of an extra drain clean that road, for roads that have a particular leaf problem. I don't know, Stuart, if you're able to answer the cost of a drain. No, yeah, drain clearances. Here, maintain the actual cleaning of the gullies. So we, we have a team and they'll go down and they'll obviously they have a rotor. So they'll, they'll be checking roads on a on a, on a a schedule. But we also do um, gully cleaning, gully clearances on a individual request as well. But the actual uh, road sweeping, that's it. Yeah, that still would be CC to, to carry out that particular task. Find that out. Now, there's a question here from uh, Dan Radbourne. Um, how much money are these cycle lanes costing uh, and will they be used? Will they have lights and pedestrian crossings? Our roads are awful for the normal car drivers that have to drive to work. Um, I think I can answer some of that. Um, but I think probably, Dan, the, the, the cycle lanes you're talking about are, are the ones that have done, come in in the last year and sort of emergency covid measures not particularly the one that we had a few years ago there was some specific government money for that and it was just announced yesterday that the one on the bristol road further down the bristol road not in edge baston that was put in is actually going to be removed um 
uh, which is ironic because I, I drove down there myself the other day and noticed that the lines were faded and I thought that was a bit unfortunate given how recent it was that that went in. Um, and I do know that in Sutton Coldfield, they um, put something in, uh, I think a cycle lane, and it costs £75,000 to put it in and £75,000 to remove it again uh, because residents objected to it. So I think those are probably the ones you're talking about uh, because they're the ones that have gone in recently and some of them are now being removed. Um, but that, again, I think there are sort of um, specific monies available for that and they don't come out of the general money that Kia has as the contractor for the highways, the one that they're separate budgets. Yeah. Um, and, and much as much as some of us may think that then the cycle lanes aren't always a good use of money, there's no money being taken away from, from the pot that's there to, to spend on, on, on repairing the actual roads. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Stuart. Um, no, no. And then there are current potholes in St James's Road uh, where the double decker bus turns to enter George Road. Surface cannot cope and it's useless just dropping in a, a dab of asphalt. Um, I think you mentioned um, St James's Road, didn't you? Yes, definitely. With, with St James's, um, Again, a lot to thank yourself and obviously everyone there for your patience on that one. There is a scheme for larger repairs, and it's it is within that scheme. So it's because of what, what we're trying to get away from with Kia is get away from the smaller. You know, we, we don't really want the patchwork quilt effect where you do a small repair, you, you, sh you shut a road for a day, and then you know it, it's twenty meters, thirty meters. The idea is. Let's do a proper job. So I say St James is it's near, nearly 600 square metres of repair work that we're doing in this summer. Um, in the interim, I appreciate it's, it is an important condition. We do it is part of a driven inspection route. So if it does get to a point where the potholes are bad, and obviously we have um, emergency teams on the network all the time, so it is driven on a regular basis. So if if we need to intervene in the interim, that's what we'll do. But um, yeah, it, it is it, it is being done this summer. So just thanks for your patience in the interim on that one. To be fair, thank you. And I'm, I'm very glad to hear that Bristol Road's been dealt with. And it's, you know, the are just unbelievable. The one that's in the shape of the arrow that was painted there a long time ago. Yeah, that's what happens. Unfortunately, when, when you burn up when you burn off the, the arrows, it's yeah, yeah. But again, thanks for your patience. It, the, the idea really is to do a more joined up approach. So in the interim, we'll patch it up, but then we'll do the bid repairs and we'll get value for money for, for residents really, which is what we want. Yeah. Um, I've got a question, another question from Liz Dancy, which is about scooters. Um, now, scooters... Matt, if, if I, oh. I, if you, I was going to say, if you wanted me, I could reply on the scooters one. No, I, I, was, I was just about to say that, Deirdre, so over to you. OK, thank you. I'll put my hand down. Right, yes, the scooters. Um, uh, that you may see several sorts of scooters. The, the scooters, which are the rental scheme owned by a company called Voy, are all peach coloured. If you see anybody riding an electronic scooter which is not peach coloured, it is a private scooter and it is illegal on both the roads and the pavements of Edgbaston. Of, uh, sorry, of, of the city. They may be allowed in some other parts of the country, but they are illegal in Birmingham. So anything, all you can do about that is report them to the police. I'm not sure how interested they'd be, but that's all you can do with that. But the peach coloured ones are owned by a company called Voy. Um, and they, you will notice there are a number of them around Edgbaston. They are spreading out through the city and people rent them um, and they pay so much of uh, the distance. I'm not sure exactly what it is. You pay, you pay by the distance. Um, to ride one of these scooters, you have to have a provisional driving licence at the very least. Um, and you are advised to wear a helmet, which you don't have to. And you are not allowed to ride on the pavement. Now, I'm quite sure all residents will have seen what I have seen, which is people not obeying these rules. Um, to start with, I have seen children on them, and clearly children do not have a provisional driving licence. Someone in that case has obviously rented the scooter and then let their child get on it. In fact, I actually saw a man let his child, who was probably about 12, get on it and go off down the pavement. And somebody else reported they'd seen children on them. I've also seen two people on one, which obviously is not allowed either. But the, the biggest bugbear really is people on the pavements, because to my mind, they, they are potentially very dangerous 
um, if they were to hit you, break your ankle, fall over, you might break your hip, whatever. They are potentially very dangerous on the pavements, particularly for more elderly pedestrians. Um, I am actually currently keeping a record of everyone I see, both on the road and on the pavement, and I intend to raise it at the council meeting next week, because my records at the moment, I have over 50% of the ones I have seen in Edgbaston in the last month or six weeks have been on the pavement. I think it's a particular problem possibly where I live because I live on Harborne Road, the one way section. And obviously, because people are paying by distance, they don't want to go the long way round. So if they want to go, say, from the physician towards Vicarage Road, they don't want to go all the way down to the church and along Westbourne Road, etc. So they go the wrong way up the pavement. So I think it's probably very predominant where I am. Now, as far as leaving them, um, you'll notice there are some places where there are a number of scooters together, and that's called a base station, um, where they may start off with six, seven, that sort of number there at the beginning of the day. You can actually leave it anywhere. Um, you don't have to take it back to the base station, but what the rider is supposed to do is to make sure it's neatly tucked against the hedge or the wall um, so that it is not blocking the pavement, it's not um, across the pavement, and they have to take a photograph when they leave it and upload it to show that they have left it in the correct position. Again, I have seen some not left in the correct position so that people would have to walk onto the road to get around them. Not too many of them, I have to say. Most people, I think, are leaving them properly. Um, Voy intend to be bringing in some uh, street furniture at these base stations, and so you will eventually be seeing um, some kind of a rack for them on the pavement where the base stations are. So um, don't be surprised if you see that popping up. Well, um, somebody said to me that they were being left in inappropriate places, but nowhere is considered inappropriate. Providing it's in the area that void covers, you can leave it on any pavement, but you should leave it neatly tucked back so that it's not in pedestrians' way. Um, I think that's more or less everything. Oh, just to say, it is actually a trial, um, which is why it was never consulted on, and the trial goes until next November. So um, if anybody has any strong feelings about it, then do email the cabinet member, Ka Councillor Wazim Zaffa, um, with your thoughts on it, because it is actually a trial. OK. Thanks. Thank you for that, Deirdre. Um, yes, I, mean, I, think, I think it's worth saying um, I attended a very bad tempered meeting of councillors um, a couple few months ago because um, these have been tried out in the city centre at first and then we were told they were coming to uh, our wards, which I think from memory it was it was Edgebaston, Harborn and Selly Oak and, and it was there was like a, about a week's notice. So when I say it was bad tempered, it was all the councillors there being bad tempered about it. It is a trial. It's part of a national trial. It's being evaluated, um, I think, ultimately by the Department for Transport. Um, but certainly any of the things that, that you see, if you let let myself or Deirdre know, we will we will pass them on to relevant people because we do. You know, it's it's fairly obvious that they're not being used entirely in the, in the way that they should do. Um, I just remembered something else as well, Matt. Um, OK, go for it. At the university with them, because people will have noticed that there are a lot of them left around the university. Um, VOI are in negotiation with the university to allow them to be uh, written on and left on the university campus. The last I heard that they have not yet come to an agreement on that. And possibly when they do come to an agreement on that, it may mean that more of them get onto the campus and aren't so much on the roads around. The next scooter meeting is a week Thursday and I might find out more about that then. But they're certainly trying to get that arrangement made, put in place. Sorry, forgot that. Okay, thank you. OK, a question from Jeremy again. Um, uh, Jeremy's worried about the local pavement litter bins not being emptied, uh, so they're packed and overflow, left like this for days. Looks terrible and unsafe. Uh, these bins are not being visited enough. Jeremy, if you can let us know exactly which bins you're concerned about, or if it's um, in particular places, we can we can pass that on. Um, so, yeah, please do let us know about any particular ones. Um, and then uh, Dan has just come back about the cycle lanes again, about making, I think, a very valid point that, um, you know, it's 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 not exactly about where the money comes from. But when we've got roads and pavements in the state that they are, um, it, it it's it's can be seen as a waste to be spending it on other things um, and also about making use of um, uh, canal networks more. Uh, why not use some of them and create lanes as Bristol Road, as, uh, create lanes as Bristol Road if our money has to be spent? I think that's a valid point. Um, 
any other questions or queries um, relating to highways, ward matters, local matters, anything else people want to raise, either raise your hand or put it in the chat. No, OK, well, I think in that case, um, I think we've we, we are, have come to the end of business unless there's anything that any of the residents or community groups wish to raise or publicise them, themselves at this point. OK, um, in that case, I'm not seeing any hands. I'm not seeing any new uh, new things in the chat. Um, so I will thank you all for coming. Um, we do intend to have a meeting in some form, um, whether it's um, whether it's virtual or in real life. Um, if we get some bids in in time for the June uh, round of celebrating communities, then we will definitely have to have a meeting of the Ward Forum before the 1st of June. Um, so if we do get some bids in, we'd like to be approved. Um, we will have a meeting before the 1st of June. We may have one anyway, um, but certainly that will be an imperative. We'll have to have it before the 1st of June. Um, otherwise, we will have a, another meeting very soon, uh, as, as soon as as soon as diaries permit. Um, I think we want to get more, uh, give you more information about the neighbourhood network scheme. And there will doubtless be other things to talk about at that time. But thank you very much for coming. And I will see you uh, on or around uh, the 1st of June, if not before. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Bye.